Hello and welcome to The Far Away Nearby. This is a show about two nerds and intellectuals sharing laughs about life and experience along the way. This is episode 7, A Britcom Diversion. And as always, I'm joined by my host, Sue. Hello, Sue. Hi, DJ. How are things going this evening? I'm well. And we are also joined by a very special guest this week. We are joined by Matt Burlingame. He is a a journalist, author, playwright, and podcaster extraordinaire. Hello, Matt. Hi, Matt. Hey. Hi. So we decided, Sue and I, that we were going to watch a favorite program together and share some of our thoughts about that show. We both have a love of British comedy, and I know that Matt does as well. This week, we're going to be talking about Waiting for God, a 90s British sitcom. So we'll go ahead, and I will start with the first question, if that's all right. Cool. Okay. So describe, uh, Matt, describe your first exposure to British television, especially the British sitcom. Did you find them through public broadcasting like many of the rest of us? And what was your first British sitcom? Um, I was 16, and uh, I was trying to find something to watch, because back then we only had like, what, four or five channels. And uh, I ended up uh, switching over to PBS, and um, I found an episode of To the Manor Born. It was uh, the beekeeping episode. <laughs> and, of course, growing up with, uh, reading Peanuts books, um, you know, I, I had a little bit of a grasp of dry humor, but um, even then, I, I just loved listening to the British accent. And when I found out not all British things were stuffy and boring and serious, <laughs> that they actually had a sense of humor... Then, Mm -hmm. um, you know, it took me watching a few shows like Good Neighbors and uh, Are You Being Served before I kind of (laughs) really understood the underlying snark of British comedy, you know, and it really made sense. But um, Mm -hmm. they can, uh, because they can say the most horrible thing to you and it still, it's good manners, you know. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) But it depends partially, I believe, on how they say it. Right, right, of course. But, uh, yeah, so To the Manor Born, and uh, that was my first introduction to it. So Penelope Keith is still a god to me, or a goddess, as the case may be. As the case may be, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and ever since then, anything that came on PBS until Amazon finally came, you know, (laughs) out into the world and said, hey, there's more than just these five shows. Yeah. (laughs) I've literally seen probably every episode of... Um, most of the old '70s shows, like "Are You Are You Being Served" and everything, probably over a hundred times. I used to watch it every night before bedtime. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it was your dark shadows? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Where, where I lived, they uh, they came on in the on Sunday afternoons. The British sitcoms. Mm-hmm. For me, it was Sunday evenings, and then repeated. I think around six on Saturdays. Yeah, I'm not sure when they repeated them. Of course, Saturday night has always been the big thing for British drama, uh, which is another of my favorite things. So, right. And so I think that um, probably the first British sitcoms that I saw were things like "Are You Being Served" and "Keeping Up Appearances." And oh yeah, um, you know, it, it was uh, not when I, I don't think it was when I was growing up. I had an ex who was older. They introduced me to a number of different shows, and I still go back and I watch Are You Being Served. I wish they would show it more on PBS, but I guess you have to buy the box sets now to see those shows. No. Yeah, sometimes, or at least out here. Yeah, I, th- I think that, that PBS all over needs has to, to draw on a, a certain amount of people to, to continue their broadcasting because they uh, they pay for all that stuff with the money they get from their viewers and and so I think they kind of have to keep up with the times to some extent although I, and I think that my favorite my fr- favorite British sitcom was couples a a um, I think that was the name of it. I didn't look this up, but it was a, a sitcom about uh, four four people that that were 
two girls and two guys that were dating and were friends and and did really stupid things. They were probably in their early to mid twenties. I think. You, what was it? Couples? I think it was couples, but I'm oh, not entirely um, certain. Coupling? That, that was maybe it was coupling. Yeah, I think. That yes, that, that would be more. That would be more appropriate. Yes, uh, or that would be more British. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, they tried to do make a show of it in the United States, and it failed miserably. Yes, I remember it was horrible. I yeah, don't even know if that got a second season. I don't, I don't know that so. it finished the first one, did it? <laughs> <laughs> I no, certainly, no. I certainly didn't also, finish the first one. That, that, that could have also been during uh, one of the years of those infamous writer strikes, too. I It could be, I don't know, but it was terrible. Well, the first, the first two episodes, I think, they took, they basically took the British script and set it in an American bar, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that yeah. was just really... <laughs> that was just really disastrous. It's right. Just, I, I don't know. And and I, I left right after that. I just, I couldn't stand it. It was one of my favorite British shows. But um, I couldn't I couldn't deal with the one that they made in the United States about it. You'll have to excuse any noise you get from my end here. I have a fan across the room, <laughs> and I have a kitty cat who does open mouth purrs. It sounds like is, my little swamp creature. <laughs> the, the kitty cat is 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 a sweeter sound than the fan. But I'll let you see the kitties. Aww, that's Mr. Babies. Oliver. He takes care of our girls, and then the one behind him is Goldie. She's our tortoise shell. She's named Goldie after Goldie Hawn because she's sweet and nuts. <laughs> I remember hearing you say that. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. The uh, the princess is uh, on the other couch. So, um, Sue, would you like to lead us in the next question? Yeah, I think I can do that. Um, so, what did Matt? What did you find about Waiting for God that was that was really fascinating or um, I, or special? I guess. See, I I think one of the reasons it kind of got to me was because um, I love strong women, mm -hmm. um, especially women who uh, cast off societal norms. Um, you know, women because women are so pressured to um, into certain standards, no matter you know what place or era or whatever they came from. I mean, except for the Star Trek, because you know everybody's yeah. kind of equal there. <laughs> but you know, uh, like Whoopi Goldberg's character in um, Color Purple, or uh, you know, Gung Ho with the Japanese wives, to yeah. where they're supposed to be so proper, and you close the door, and they're fighting with their husbands. So um, I think <laughs> so Diana, I mean, was right up my alley. You know, plus um, more television shows. Especially in America, give us more of the stereotypical old people. I mean, they're either they're either completely decrepit or they're mean. Yes. Um, so there's always been kind of a lack of really good rounded senior characters. Um, but I mean, if you look at if you look at Britcoms, especially in the 70s and 80s, there were a lot of um, shows with strong older characters, but they still acted like older people were supposed yeah. to act. <laughs> You know, and um, the shows were still focused on the younger characters. So when Waiting for God broke all these rules, it just, for some of us, I think as we grow older and we become more concerned about our own dotage, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, a show like this kind of gives us hope that we won't turn into like Hyacinth Bouquet's daddy, you know, and we're totally <laughs> off a rocker and, you know, whatever. So, yeah, I mean, it just broke so many molds. And right. um, Diana is Diana is me. So yeah, <laughs> you know, I, yeah, I, I was totally sucked into that. I was like, yes, I love this woman. Yes, I yeah. I, I can see I can see that it, because yeah, it, there is. I don't think there's anyone there that really plays a a typical old person, or at least that you get much feedback or much hammer time for. Yeah, some of the side characters, you know, kind of do their little, you know, oh, we're, we're here and we're just waiting to die. But Yeah, um, but they, they don't really give you much camera time or, or right. information about them personally uh, because Basil is the uh, sex, the god. sex, the, the sex <laughs> god. And yeah. uh, is he the same one that goes off on the three-month trip with the woman? They take a cruise for 
Is they well, going to get married to take it three months cruise? They rigged a contest, I think, so that they could go on a honeymoon. Yeah, yeah. that could be. <laughs> and then, of course, she ended up. Um, she ended up running off with somebody else on the cruise, I think. Right. Yeah. They, but that was Basil. That was. Is that correct, or was that a different character? I think I that was Basil. I believed it was him, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I was... was... And I was going to say, that was one of the uh, same uh, actors that had been on um, Are You Being Served, wasn't it, Matt? Uh, Basil? Yeah. No. Uh, no, he wasn't on Are You Being Served. He was on To the Man of War. Oh. Uh, he, he played um, the, the farm workers who later took over for Bravenger when uh, Bravenger <laughs> was too sick to be on the show for a while. So. Yeah. Uh, he's, he sort of reminded me of the younger guy that came in for Mr. Grace before the show was over. Mm. Oh, yes, yeah. No, that wasn't him, but I can definitely see that, yeah. Hmm. yeah. Well, yeah, the uh, second Mr. Grace was kind of creepy, but, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. I, I, I didn't really care for Are You Being Served, although I watched a number of episodes of it, but I it just didn't quite do me. They, they, uh, I, I can't remember the names of some of these things. Uh, but the the one this this may have been the neighbor's character, but I'm not not entirely certain. There was a a woman that uh, was really uh, there was a show with a woman that was really a uptight about being having the perfect home and she had relatives that she didn't Keeping want up to appearances yes yeah. I, th- that was that was th- those that and are you being served came together on Sunday afternoon and they uh, and I really preferred the keeping up appearances more than the are you being served well um, what appealed to me most about waiting for God was you know, I grew up with strong women, as Matt was saying, that that was part of the appeal to me. You know, my my mom had the job that made the money for the household, and I had two sisters. And when I was oh, seven or eight, my best friend was the old lady that lived across the street from me. So <laughs> <laughs> she, you know, she was po- probably in her 80s, and she had just had a fascinating life. She had been an army nurse. And I had all these great stories, so I think I saw a little bit of her in Diana. Yeah, well, DJ, the the older women in the area where I lived, in the town where I lived, were really obnoxious creeps. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't really care for them. They uh, they seemed to all love me, but I was not very fond of them. But being a, a small town of a population under a thousand people, it you sort of just dealt with the people that were there, and and most of the most of the old older women or old women, I I would have definitely said then, uh, were not people that I would have wanted to model myself after. Mm-hmm. I think it probably helped that it was my mom's boss's mo- mother too. <laughs> ah, well, that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I felt like such a heel later on because I was just such a spoiled little brat. I would not eat at other people's houses, and she could have been a world-class chef, and I would have never known <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, that does happen, you know. That's... So, um, so did you say what you found drew you to the show, Waiting for God? I, well, it's funny. It is really funny. Uh, it seems like almost every exchange of lines is funny. But it also, I, I do like, I do like Diana. Uh, she reminds me of a Scottish woman that I worked for for a while. That was nowhere near that old, but she. <laughs> She was an interesting lady, and who who was always criticizing what was going on in society. Now she had a different take on it than Diana did, because she had a more um, socialistic, Eastern Bloc socialistic type take on the world. But but she was very critical of things, and a lot of the things she criticized, there was good reason to criticize in our in our society and the way women were treated. I think I am a little bold, older than both of you, so. I was I was just coming of age and and in the university when women were trying to establish a more equal place with with men on our planet, especially in this country. And I and on another comment, I think maybe the reason that they that the Brits started having uh, comedies 
and other shows about older people earlier than we did is because their population was aging faster than ours was. And, and I think they still have, not like Japan, that they don't have the problem of, of so many old people, but like Japan has, but they do have a, a greater ratio, I believe, of old people to young people than we have. And, and I think that may be part of it. Society causes some things to just jump up. And they may have also not fired all their female women as they got older and needed roles for them, and they may have had writers that were aging. And I know that a lot of female writers get knocked out of the world in the United States, or at least that's the rumor. So I don't know that right. as an absolute fact, not being involved in the uh, movie industry or television industry, but that's rumors I hear. Right. Well, and I mean, you look at our equivalent of what we consider a senior show being the Golden Girls. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, and they're they're not quite at that level. They're still out on their own. They're doing their thing. And Ma is kind of the, the yeah. Um, you know, who would be Diana's contemporary. So, mm -hmm. but and, and you still see Diana not acting like Ma at all. <laughs> So uh, this is true. Although Ma had a a a kind of well, I didn't watch this that show as much. I wasn't a very very, very big fan of the Golden Girls because to, to some extent they were still they were still behaving like proper women. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, I'm sure that's true. But when I was a kid and Golden Girls was in its initial run, I was not allowed to watch that because it was too <laughs> racy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I can I can see that that would happen, but of course I it, there's a number of years between you and I, and I was an adult when Twelve and Girls was on was on television. So I believe either that or I didn't have a television at the time. Would you like to ask the next question, Sue? Uh, so, what are the differences between American and British sitcom? Do you do you all see? Uh, besides the um, that we pick up on things a bit slower. I know that uh, DJ had mentioned in our preparations that that the uh, we the Americans have copied a number of of the British shows, but I know that that also goes the other way. But right off the top of my head, I can't think of any of the American shows that that we that, that were copied by Britain. And sometimes they all get so jangled up, it's hard to tell who is who, who started what. But, you know the differences between American and British sitcoms. I think one of the main ones is probably, um, which is finally catching on here, is that the problem or situation of the episode wasn't always solved in 22 minutes, or I mean, sometimes even at all. Um, American sitcoms were almost. I mean, they're almost always wrapped up at the end. You know, we we have yeah. our happy little. You know, here's here's the situation. Here's how it all gets messed up, and then at the end, we all learn our lesson. You yes. know, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and and you know, or or if it's a very special episode of like you know, Growing Pains, where you know Tracy Gold's warning uh, Matthew Perry's death from being a drunk driver. It's a you know, it goes for two episodes. Yeah. Um, but um, with a lot of British sitcoms, I mean, there there really isn't always a solution, or the lead characters don't always win. It's just kind of this slice of life. It's more of a journey that you're taking with the characters. And um, I mean, the fact that you keep I, like we're talking about keeping up appearances. If you if you're watching some of those, sometimes they don't even have real endings. Like it's the, true. You know, it's just kind of like. <laughs> It just trails off into the closing credits, and you're like, "What? What? What's the point? Nothing was solved. You know, there's no big closing <laughs> message that sitcoms taught us to expect. It's like, what did we learn this week, Timmy? I don't know. She's still <laughs> running away. So, yeah, I, I think. I mean, technically, I think that's kind of the thing, but I think also that. You know, another thing is they're not afraid to take the chances that here here we seem and and I don't live there, so this could be off base, but <laughs> it seems like they're they're more willing to take chances with with here. It's like if if you're not going to get that rating, you know, if you're not going to appease the audience and get the rating and have the uh, the um, financial backing from all your sponsors, that's the bottom line. It's like you, yeah. you have to have that money and you have to have that percentage of the rating. Whereas over there. 
there, it seems like they're more willing to take risks with things. And two, with them, it's like six to ten episodes for most yeah. seasons or series. So if it doesn't work, nah, we'll just move on to something else. Yeah, so. it's um, yeah. I would I would have to agree with that. I I also think that they are more likely to have unattractive actors. Mm. If if you ever notice that that in an American show, any kind of show, there is all sorts of everybody is is is, is generally very pretty. Yeah, the, the homeless people in the alley back there, you know, could are, yeah. are ex models. Yes. Yeah, they they can't. <laughs> we we don't have anyone that is. But if you notice, like in and Are You Serving God, Jane is not a beautiful woman, and she does described as not a beautiful woman. I mean that that's that's they make jokes about that. But if she were in an American sitcom, she would be a gorgeous person, and you'd be sitting there going, what do you mean she's not attractive? Right. She takes <laughs> off her glasses and shakes out her hair, and suddenly she's a beauty queen. Yes. yes. Yeah. She's yeah. just, and I don't know, I have no idea what the actress that plays Jane, that is Jane, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. I, I, I've been getting some, some books and movies confused. There's too many Janes in my life here. <laughs> but when Jane, when when Jane Jane is just not a very she's a, a homely person and she looks like a homely person. But when you have homely persons in 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 American television or movies, they are not homely. Right. Or if they are, they're usually the uh, the the bad guy. Yeah. Or the creepy person. Or yeah. Well, yeah. I, you could say that there's something about Jane that is kind of creepy, but. <laughs> But I really like Jane. Mm-hmm. She she would after the two main characters, she would be my favorite character because she is um, she is funny. She is smarter than she seems. Although sometimes she is dumber than you think that any person could be. <laughs> <laughs> Denial she, does a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, but. Um, she is never as dumb as Harvey, obviously. <laughs> That's for sure. But I think you'd be reaching somewhere to do that. And Harvey's supposed to be a pretty person. It's yeah. true. And I don't know that he's not pretty. He's not very well put together. I, I think he, he's just, there's something about his grooming. That, I think that, he's supposed to represent the chauvinist element. Well, yes. I mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> really. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I think sure an American right. remake would have it would have Harvey's character probably being a, a beautiful woman, and you know the Jane character would be kind of a homely guy. Could be. Yeah, because they. I mean, American remakes of things they usually flip things. Well, right? sometimes they don't. They don't always. And uh, but that would be an interesting take on that, actually. Maybe we should write no. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, it's okay. <laughs> I, I, I don't. I don't know. I've been writing off and on all my life, but I just have never done anything with it. But but from time to time, I come up with things like, "Wow, that would be an interesting thing to do." Mm-hmm. But so, th- that doesn't last very long, usually. So, in your opinion, how do you think British sitcoms have managed to insert so much innuendo and still remain? fairly innocent on top of them being extremely well written uh, I, I would actually say for a long time I preferred British television to American television because it was just so much better written um, I mean British humor is the is the queen of the double entendre <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I also think there's like an interplay between you know the, the stuffy British stereotype and the, the European influence for not being as sexually repressed as we are here um, and I think especially to in America that plays I mean obviously they love it in Britain but here when we watch the British TV we see them with our own prejudices so it makes it I think for some of us who really get it it makes it even more funny but I mean when you're looking at 1973 and Mrs. Slocum talking about you know how her pussy wins an award every time she shows it you know (laughs) to whereas you know over here in 1973 we have Jan Brady wearing an afro wig you know (laughs) Right. So yeah, and yet there's a, a they both have this kind of naivete about them that makes them 
kind of friendly, you know, and, yeah. and it's like they're not, like, when we do sexuality here, I mean, it's in your face. You know exactly <laughs> what they're talking about, and there's there's no there's there's no bones about it. But, you know, over there, especially in the, the 70s and 80s, which is mostly the shows that I was watching, it's more tongue-in-cheek, it's more subtle, it's more, well, she could be talking about her cat, yeah. you know, so... <laughs> So I, I, but again, it comes back to just really, really good writing. Yeah, I think that I think that's it. But I think also that if you were British watching that, you might understand it more clearly mm-hmm. than being an American watching it, <laughs> because it doesn't necessarily come across. Um, <laughs> the same way. Yeah, I think the beautiful thing about Innuendo is it's kind of like eavesdropping. Depending on who heard it, you know, you get a different reaction. Right. Catching the wrong end of the stick. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But I, one of the things that I had a problem with, because I've watched these all in a row, and I had only watched a few of these in the past, it, it, when they showed them in it, here, they did not show them at a convenient time for me, but uh, the Waiting for God series. But one of the things that I've had a problem with is that Tom doesn't know how to drive, but he drives an awful lot, and he drives pretty reasonably most of the time. And that just <laughs> was like, okay, now one or the other, these things has to be true, or or maybe not. I, I don't know, but, but at... Um, you know, you think you think at his age he either unless he has real strong dementia. And I don't think there's any evidence of that uh, he's a little bored with life. I think and has been for a long time, mm-hmm. which is his American movie fascination. But but he seems to be able to drive. Only sometimes he's not, and and I just don't understand that very well. I think. <laughs> Tom's a conundrum because, you know, uh, among other elements of the stories in Waiting for God, it establishes that besides the age factor, these are people just like you and me. And it's just um, very interesting when you consider the character of Tom because, you you know, you automatically assume this is just an old man who's got dementia or something and he's reliving his old war stories. But it's not so far-fetched to think that, you know, everything turns around in life. You start off in diapers and you might end on diapers. And, right. you know, maybe him revisiting his old war stories is nothing different than, you know, a little boy having an imaginary friend. Yeah. Well, I, go ahead. Yeah, well, I was going to say, yeah, you, you could see it like that. I think that he's just kind of bored. He's been living mm-hmm. with his son and this crazy woman and presumably some pretty crazy uh, children for 15 years. And I think he's just, you know, a little bored. I think that would be very boring. I think life is much more interesting for him once he moves to the to the retirement community or whatever they're calling it. Well, the the best example of his, you know, imagination was when they called in the psychiatrist, and the <laughs> psychiatrist knew that he was pulling his leg. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, the psychiatrist said something about uh, the two of them could not make up those kind of stories if they weren't if they didn't have clear minds and and perfectly capable of coping in society or something. Yeah, I, I think he's completely sane. I think, yeah. you know, he just, he's one of those people that had, um, you know, after he lost his wife, who was at that point the love of his life, he had a career that he hated. He had a, a son who, you know, married this shrew and... <laughs> You know, his his entire life did not turn out to be what he wanted, so he just decided to lose himself into adventure, and uh, and then uh, you know, I think it also, especially when he he's there and he does that stuff, I think part of it is to to get attention or just what you know, really meditate out of the world and um, you know, have some fun. But yeah, I I think that it's just a way of I, I certainly as a child I can remember myself and and one of my next door neighbors we we acted out I don't know how many different movies we'd go see a movie and we would spend you know half the summer pretending like we were people in that movie and we would mm-hmm. rewrite it and do stuff mm-hmm. with it and I think he was just doing the same thing he's just he didn't have anybody to play with right and Absolutely. and and so he covered he he went into his tunnel with the, with the blankets over his head. <laughs> 
Yeah, it just takes me back to a story that I shared at my wedding where I said that I had to have my sisters at my wedding because when I was little, they dressed me up and would play wedding. <laughs> <laughs> and I should say that I wasn't necessarily as a boy. <laughs> yeah. Well, ah, sisters. <laughs> yes, they, they are wonderful, especially older sisters. Did you want to ask our next question, Sue? Uh, yeah, here. Oh, of course, did you have a favorite episode? Of the, or did we, we, we didn't do this, right? You want the love of Tom and Diana. Lo- Whoa, where am I at? We all love Tom and Diana, but are there other characters, that, some of the minor characters that you feel as strongly about as, as that? I didn't read that. Okay. Um, I think my favorite minor character is probably Sarah, Diana's niece, um, because uh, she, she just seems to be one of those perfect characters, and she won't buy into any of their <laughs> stuff. You know, she's like, and she she um, really loves and idolizes Diana and puts up with all the horrible things that she says and does to her. <laughs> you know, basically knowing, I know you're trying to push me away, but you're not going to do it because you're mm-hmm. my favorite person. Um, so I, I love her character, but I also think that, I mean, Sandra Payne as Marion just steals the show, especially when they let go of her being so uptight and she kind of just, her character gives up and she starts doing alcohol and drugs to the point where she's just, she, uh, her character, while everything else is going on, her character can stumble behind the entire scene and steal the show. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, that to me, that is, you know, while I don't care for, you know, the character annoys me, but she does such a wonderful job at annoying me that, you know, you just, the actress is brilliant. So uh, I think in that aspect, she's probably one of my favorites. But Sarah's character, Sarah's character really speaks to me. Yeah, yeah I would have out. Um, but Sarah's character really speaks to me. Yeah, and I would I would have to agree to that. I I. I identify fairly strongly with Diane, but I, I I like Jane, I like I like Sarah, I like most of the minor characters, especially the women. I suppose I am not as taken by some of the men who are, who are fairly ridiculous and people I wouldn't want to spend a lot of time around. Yeah, the the show really seems to be well written for the female characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're it's a, they're very strong, well rounded characters, and the men tend to sometimes be a little bit more stereotypes of who you would think they were supposed to be. Well, it's, kind of one note. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's possible that it's hard. It, it's sometimes hard to find a a version of them. I, I, I don't know, but um, I have known elderly men like that, and I would just, and I guess I would just as soon not. <laughs> but of course, as as Basil says every now and again, the there are so many more women that survive to those ages than there are men. That if you are interested in having any kind of interaction with a person of another uh, of another gender, you almost have to deal with with whatever comes up, and many of the People, many of the men who seem to live to that age seem to be obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, well, I, guys, but I just... <laughs> male privilege. <laughs> right. <laughs> Probably. I'm sure that's part of it. Well, I think I would have to agree with Matt that the Sarah character is my favorite. Uh, there was a really tough moment in the beginning of the series uh, for me when she comes to visit Diana and Diana kind of pushes her back for a moment and tells her that she doesn't want her to come and see her anymore. And it just it broke my heart a little bit there because, you know, it's just like you think for the, uh, from the beginning that this young woman is just terrible because she tries to poison her aunt and do all these <laughs> terrible things. And it's just, you know, all perception, of course, from Diana. And then you realize that she actually has a heart of gold and, you know, she, she rearranges her schedule to be around her. Mm-hmm. And it was just so touching uh, towards the end when you realize she does value her only aunt and she named her own daughter after her. Mm-hmm. Yep. Even though she doesn't buy into her her aunt's philosophy. Uh, but, and, and Diane, with the, when, she ha- when Sarah has the baby, is just precious. The two yes. of them are just, that is a wonderful, 
wonderful episode. So many British actors seem to be professional thespians and possibly prone to a greater diversity of roles than their American counterparts, going from comedy to drama, whereas an American might seem to stick to either just stage or movies or television only. In your experience, have you noticed recently that there's been more of an interchange of those venues? Have you seen this in your own work? Sure. The, what is it? The, um, the guy that plays Flash is a stage actor. Um, you know, half the cast of Glee were from Broadway. Uh, yeah. You know, there's, yeah, I think it's becoming, it's becoming more. I mean, there used to be a thing of where a lot of actors who wanted to do movies, they always told you don't do television because if you do television, you'll get recognized, you'll get stuck in a part, you'll never make it in movies. Um, but, so I think, yes, that is changing. I, um, but I think the thing that I think is the most interesting is that so so much of the non-commercial programming show, or maybe I shouldn't put it that way, a lot of the shows now that are not um, the the like three network syndicated, they're they're on the yeah. cable shows that they're really popular. That a lot of them we think are American actors, but they're British and Australian. Uh, you yeah. know, with classical training, and there's just so many of them. I mean, like Andrew Lincoln on The Walking Dead, uh, Hugh Laurie in House. Actually, I think mm -hmm. House may be syndic you know, uh, network TV, but uh, I mean, Hugh Laurie was a huge comedic actor. I mean, he was in Black Adder with Rowan Atkinson. You know, <laughs> yeah. I, he just he, and yet here he is doing this serious role in American television. Everybody thinks he's American, and they just like, oh, he's just some upstart. And like, no, he has. <laughs> Huge because British nobody, career. Yeah, because yeah. nobody had ever seen him before. And uh, I, I think it's also true that more Australians than the Brit British are, are coming over to the United States has more money for them. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely see that. There was actually, I read online not too long ago, where there was a push from American actors to stop, uh, to, <laughs> to kind of get Hollywood to stop using British actors because they were pushing all the Americans. American actors out of roles, but you know, with Amer a lot of American actors are, you know, they do do their training and they do their due diligence, but there's also a lot that get hired because they're pretty and mm -hmm. they're not really trained and then you get a, a British or an Australian actor who's been, you know, to, you know, uh, RADA and he has this amazing career and they come over here and they walk you into a role and blow us all away. We love them. So I think that's the thing, the trend that I'm seeing a lot more of rather than, um, you know, stage to television and things like that. Yeah. Well, I think that, uh, the, when Kevin Spacey did the Netflix television, mm -hmm. uh, the political show, um, that seemed to have shocked a number of people into thinking, well, maybe you could actually do television and not kill your career. Mm -hmm. uh, somehow, uh, television is different. I, it, on Netflix is is a little different when the, when a series is released on that, and of course Netflix and and well and now Amazon have sort of blown or disrupting the movie and television industry. But but uh, it's, I have heard that mentioned that they went when uh, I can't remember the name of this, and this is another show that was uh, borrowed from Britain. Is it House of uh, Cards? The, yeah, the House of Cards. There was that was uh, that was a British show before it was American show, mm -hmm. and 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 it was made and it was made and they released all the episodes for the once the first season by uh, at the same time, which is really unusual. <laughs> you can't think of mm -hmm. until they started having this this ability to live stream things. I can't I can't recall that ever happening. Yeah, and and I think too that the shows that come out to Netflix. And, and Amazon and even some of the cable stations, um, the reason, I mean, they're not beholden to ratings and advertisers. They are, they, they can, they can be more adult. They can tackle more themes. They can, they mm -hmm. can be a 13 hour uh, movie or mini series or something that's very hard hitting instead of something that has to be dumbed down for a general audience because you know, they're going to have their 12 year old watching. Yeah. So, yeah. Of course I, you I can't hear him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I definitely understand what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, I of course you can't guarantee that they're under 12 year olds watching on, oh, on Netflix or, or <laughs> Amazon, but that's the parents' responsibility, and it's nothing that mm -hmm. that, that any um, network can control. That's 
Right. Definitely. Makes you wonder how many actors are uh, trying on fake British accents just to get roles. <laughs> Well, you know, in America, if you have a, a British accent, we're going to think you're from anywhere. You know, I mean, uh, it's a, a, a show set in Greece, a show set in, in the Middle East. Hey, you know, as long as you have an English accent, we'll buy that you're, you know, you, that that's where you're from. Mm-hmm. I, I love those new car commercials that they have out where, you know, it's presumed that all the British people are villains. <laughs> Uh-huh. Well, that could be some of the kickback of, of uh, the professions that, that, that are involved with, with commercials and, and advertising, uh, getting the kickback on the there are too many British actors coming over and mm-hmm. taking our jobs because that is those are those are the kinds of people that are involved in, in making advertising. And on the flip side of the you know, all British actors being villains, uh, there's another car commercial. It's uh, it's a different company. I think Jaguar is now doing commercials with Britons and um, in the commercial they talk about how the, the British don't rag normally and you know it's, <laughs> it's the theme for the new Jaguar commercials because now they've got something to brag about oh yeah well I guess if I could afford a Jaguar I might brag a little bit too uh-huh. <laughs> but you gotta love that Diana steals her niece's Porsche <laughs> yes it's true yes <laughs> Well, and why she doesn't have a car, I don't quite understand. Well, she probably had to turn it in when she was, right. uh, you know, dropped off. And actually, that ends. Uh, now, it, it, she says that she bought, she had researched the place and she had bought into the place because apparently they buy their little apartments like a condo. Mm-hmm. And she said that she bought into this because she thought this was going to be a good experience, a life experience for her at the end of her days. So, you know, as she was no longer a when she had to retire and there's a story somewhere in there about that she tells about how she was sort of forced out there was a point at which she was sort of forced out of, of the job she had and she never tells you exactly who she worked for right well that was part of a story in an episode before they moved in together she lost her pension because her employer went out of business or went bankrupt mm-hmm. but um, oh, I, I apparently was getting something out of the kitchen or didn't watch that episode <laughs> well <laughs> but uh, I think that begs the question because, of course, in the first episode, they're just there. And uh, mm-hmm. I, I have to wonder, Matt, do you think that maybe Sarah, her niece, might have had a hand in her living at Bayview? Maybe because the uh, you mean because uh, they're somewhat close? Uh, close. Uh, well, I'm just thinking, you know, how uh, Tom was dropped off by his son because he oh. had, you know, become a burden to their love life or whatever. Yeah. And, and um, <laughs> may, maybe <laughs> Diana's niece became too involved with her modeling business and she dropped her off. No, I don't think so. I think yeah. I think she would have done I think she would have probably wanted Diana to uh, Stay live with her. her. Yeah. yeah. Um I, I think that Diana was one of those people that um she was very determined that she didn't want to be a burden to anyone, that she was going to make her own way and she was going to live by her own rules and you know, she she bought into the the idea that she was gonna be there and I, I think the only thing that, that probably made her settle on being there was that it was in somewhat of a close uh, distance to uh, to Sarah, even though she probably didn't want to admit it to herself. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, I think she was too headstrong to... Uh, you know, be a charity case, as she would probably say. Well, yeah, and I, I but I, there's that, I can't remember which episode it was, but there's an episode where she talks about how she had, and I think it's when they were making changes, some kind of changes in the, in the running of the, of the institution, that she had researched this place, and she had, and she had decided on coming here, because this was, this was going to be, you know, her, whatever, the, her end of life, she was coming here to die, sort of, mm-hmm. uh, which is fits with her very dark, <laughs> her very dark image of, of what's of what's going on and, and and of a life in general. And I don't think she was now. Tom, I think, was encouraged to go there, whether or not he. And, oh yeah. But he apparently had money to go, there. and when he went, he gave the house to his son and, and daughter. Right. And they were also investors in in Bayview as well. Well, eventually, but not at the beginning. I don't. Right. Yeah. That, that came at a later time, I think. We only have a few more questions. Uh, Sue, did you want to go ahead and pick up... Is there a character in Waiting for God that you or someone 
you know relates to or, or bears a resemblance to? I, uh, <laughs> I am Diana, and I promise you when I am 70, I will be there with a cane, and I will be whacking people with it. Yeah. And I will be not <laughs> taking anybody's uh, guff or anything else. I mean, to I, um, I to me, Diana is what Murphy Brown would turn into. Yeah. Uh, you know, and and these are the people that I've kind of modeled myself after, so that you know, I I don't intend to be one of those people that suddenly one day wake up and. I'm old and I act old and you know I I just give up on everything and wait to be shuffled away and and taken off the mortal coil you know so if so yeah I Diana is is very much somebody that reminds me of me and who I will be well, I would guarantee you that you can wake up one morning and be old, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to act old. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, and that, that's that's the hardest. And, of what and I'm I saying. think that I think that the, I think that's the the hardest thing. And I think that people who act old are just um, they have just I I don't know given up on life. I guess uh, right. I always figured as long as I read a book. Or, or watch movies, or, or see television, maybe see a play occasionally, that I was going to be kind of okay. Uh, but I know there are other people that just sort of become old people overnight. Yeah. Well, and I, I think it. I think also that um, they feel it's expected of them. You know, this is how my grandmother acted. This is how my grandfather acted. This is what I'm supposed to do. You know, I'm going to, and I I just, I've never understood how one day you, you go from being a strong, independent person or, or whoever you are, and then one day you're, you know, Mole Man from The Simpsons. Well, and, uh, you know, my, my husband Billy's uh, family is just, um, it's just an extension of that you know, growing older and not necessarily changing because his grandparents lived into their 90s. And my mother-in-law has told me that when they were in their 70s, she had the task of taking away their snowmobiles because her 70-year-old mother <laughs> broke her wrist on her snowmobile. Awesome. Wow, if that's all she broke, I wouldn't yeah. have taken My mother's mother, we arrived in this fair city to to take care of her because she had become an old person and she had always been a very strong and somewhat manipulative woman uh, and and in some ways she was sort of like Diana only she was she was really mean she told a doctor one day that had come to see her and was making a home visit back in the day when they still did such things and she told her that she had no idea who who my mother and I were these were just people that showed up on her porch one day and had no place to live, so she let them move in. For me, I think that I don't really have anyone specific that I think, <laughs> uh, you know, in my life that resembles characters of Waiting for God. I'd like to think that all of the strong women in my life, I think, you know, um, have a, a little bit of Diana in them. And I think that's, of course, as I said before, that was one of the reasons that the show appealed to me. But, Matt, I sort of said it in the beginning before we started the show that uh, Sue is sort of my Diana. And that's kind of ironic because I didn't even <laughs> learn about the show until after she and I met. And we've been friends for, oh, 16 years now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the lady before you here is the one who met me when I was still in my late 20s and possibly not in a good relationship and supported me and helped me to get out of that situation. She also encouraged me to register to vote and to get my license. So... Here you are, Diana. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Do you have a favorite episode of Waiting for God? And what was the storyline, and what did you enjoy most about it? I think probably my favorite episode is the one where they quote-unquote stole Sarah's car and went to the ocean. <laughs> um, and the cops caught them and escorted them back. And 
Uh, you know, the thing that was that that why that stands out so much to me is one probably one of my favorite episodes is that um, I was actually buying into it. When they were scolding them and, and saying, you know, what if something had happened and this is irresponsible and you stole this car and et cetera. And I, I was buying everything that they were saying. And then Tom stands up and gives his speech and we find out that she's got a license and that she's an adult and she, you know, she's, <laughs> she can leave if she damn well wants to. And, and it just, it, not only was it kind of an epiphany moment for me going, oh, that's right. But, yeah. um, you know, but at the same time, it just it showed so much of what the entire series is about is that just because they're older people doesn't mean that they have lost their their faculties or anything else. I mean, that was really a groundbreaking speech. And I was like, hell, yeah. Well, uh, um, but I think probably my favorite scene, though, um, is one where Sarah gave birth and Diana breaks down sobbing. Um, yeah. Because, and I think the way that they did it, it was because, you know, even though she may not have wanted children, um, or more likely it just didn't work out that way for her, she, it, it was a very real moment where it seemed like she was mourning for what could have been, uh, what can never be now, and yeah. you know even even the the child she could never have, and and the way Diana Diana's past was, it, it kind of it kind of makes me wonder if maybe she was pregnant at one time and opted not to carry to term. But I mean that was just such an incredible moment, and it was so real. Yeah. And um, just gave, and that was one of the things too. Is there's so many moments like that that show you the real thing of you you're coming to terms with an age where you realize there are things and dreams that you can't do anymore so like tom you have to find new ones yeah and, and I, it's not about giving up it's about finding new things yeah and i think to some extent that's what diana expected when she when she bought the the little apartment there right Absolutely. And I kind of like the episode where Tom's laying in the in the corridor in the hospital when he collapses. They think that's when he collapses. And Diane comes in and going, "Well, what are you doing in the hospital in the corridor?" <laughs> and I remember when we had problems with that in the United States as well. I don't think we do any longer. And I'm not sure that Britain does either, but you never can tell. So, what about you, DJ? Well, I think that my favorite episode would have to be the one where Sarah gave birth because yeah. I've, I've been through an experience over the last few years. I, I moved home to be closer to my family, and I'm the youngest, so everybody else has their own family and their own kids. So I'm at a position where I'm going to be turning 40 soon, and I'm just thinking sink or swim. So my husband and I are hoping to consider adopting in the near future because I, I, I'm thinking about situations like this in Waiting for God where at the end when you're in your twilight who is there to still care about you I really enjoyed the episode where Sarah gave birth because um, Diane had been through such an experience where she thought she was going to die and when Sarah gives birth Diana's had a brush with death, so you know it. It just it brings the whole mortality into issue into question. Mm -hmm. Now she's not only got her niece who thinks the world of her; she doesn't always remember that. But now there's somebody that's going to take her place because she has a great niece that's been named after. And that was just such a great moment when they take the newborn back to the retirement home and she proclaims that here's the new Diana. <laughs> yeah. Well, and also that it's her baby. And she's always talking <laughs> about yes. her baby. <laughs> so, And also that they, they tackled sexuality was a, a very groundbreaking thing for the series. Yeah. You know, with them having sex finally and all that. I loved in the very beginning when uh, t uh, Tom and Diana first get flirty. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I, there's a moment where Tom's in his uh, in his easy chair, and Diana's sitting across from him, and he's trying to get her to divulge a secret, and he says something of, to the like of, um, you know, if you don't tell me, I'll have my way with you, and she says, my lips are sealed. <laughs> <laughs> So go ahead and ask the okay. uh, last question. I think our last question was, if they, if they were to have another season, where would you think it would go to? I think Diana probably would have gotten pregnant. And <laughs> they would have had, they gone on their hunt. No, I, honestly, I, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, well, that's a good answer. I think, Always yeah, no, I, I, I think they probably would have, um, turn the focus a little bit more from Diana and uh, Tom to probably Harvey and Jane because of their marriage. And they probably would have turned it into Jane's, you know, becoming a woman and, and uh, starting a family and doing that. And they probably would have started to focus more on that. Um, and that just seems to be the, the way that they do on these shows, you know. Yeah. Once you have a marriage, then... It, it's the whole exploration after that. So, yeah, but, and I'm not sure that they would have wanted to have taken this show there. Yeah, but I also think that once, once Tom and Diana got together, because for a while there, they they were really taking a season where they made Diana mean and over the yeah. top with her with her cruelty. Um, it was no longer fighting for the fighting for the you know, for right. justice, it, yeah, it was just justice, yeah. being bitter. And I think and it finally pulled back on that when she and Tom moved in together a bit. And I think they probably would have continued along that line and made her um, not lose her identity, but maybe become more more A little softer. more soft, yeah. Yeah. Maybe she would have gotten to her great niece's first day of school. There you go, yeah. That would have been good, yeah. I I think that if they had done another season, that maybe you know, well, this is probably more a tendency of an American show, but um, you know, maybe the focus would have moved away from Tom and Diana to just as Matt had said to maybe Harvey and Jane, but maybe they would have introduced a new couple that would have moved in, and so maybe the stories would have started following the new couple or something. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's always hard for me to predict British shows because they frequently don't go where I think they ought to. Yep. And they... <laughs> now we... Now our shows are doing it, but back then, they'd kill off a character without a second thought. Yeah. Although That's I do true. have... I do have to say, though, that I'm extremely frustrated with their short seasons because we have to wait until, what is it, 2017 for the uh, next Doctor Who? <laughs> right, right. That wraps up this episode of The Far Away Nearby. We want to thank you for listening, and a very special thank you to our guest, Matt. So thank you for listening to The Far Away Nearby. You can visit our webpage at pfnpodcast.com, find our fan page on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at TFNDJ, and visit our companion blog on Tumblr. Our show is available on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. Send us an email at tfnpodcast at gmail.com or call and leave a message at 720 720- Two three zero six nine one nine. This show is part of the Pride Forty Eight Network. Find more shows over at Pride Forty Eight dot com.